I know you've seen this Matrix Rain effect, and I know you've seen Minesweeper, but have you ever seen the twain combined? No, you have not. That, anyways, is what this tutorial is about. How do we procedurally make a Minesweeper system that evaluates what the board should look like, given some mines, and then by doing that, we can have the mines kind of go down in this kind of rain. Let's get started. On Reddit, there's a Minesweeper Reddit where it's literally just memes, because what is there even to talk about? Some dude made a tier list, and I just want to take these and extract them as low-resolution tiles. For me, my tool of choice is GIMP, but you could do this in whatever. So let's do a 32 by 32 pixel icon. Drop this bad boy in here. All we need to extract is the mine and the numbers. I don't necessarily need anything else. Maybe let's go with the red one. And because there are eight numbers that it could be, for the mine, I'm going to make a new naming convention. I'm just going to call it 9.png. Here's the number one, two, three, four score, and where the fuck is five? Six, I'm not a chick. Seven, my name is Devin. Eight, I ate a lot of ice cream yesterday. Yesterday, which, by the way, they released the new, what is it, S'more McFlurry? So fucking good. It kind of tastes like Lucky Charms in this weird way. And I have no clue why there's a nine. Like, well, what's it, like, are you playing three-dimensional Minesweeper where there's more tiles? I also need a empty tile, so this one I'm gonna name zero. Here we go, we got our nine, but ten tiles that we need. We're just gonna do a texture swap where each tile inherits one of these images. For the logic of Minesweeper, we just need to make a grid that follows certain properties. Get rid of this group input. I'm gonna make a grid that you can either think of it as we're evaluating like certain mines or numbers on the faces. I think what will be a lot easier as we look at these intersections, the points, if we're looking at this point over here, we need to look at its neighbors. So the one to the left, the right, up, down, but also diagonally. There's like eight different things it can be touching. And that is just easier to do with a point. We check how many mines is it neighbor to, and that assigns the number. Now, one unfortunate thing is I can't just like take a grid by default, where let's say we have 30 by 30, because there are no diagonal connections. If I look at this point, it effectively only has four neighbors. I need to somehow connect these diagonals. What we're trying to do is we're trying to make triangles. Fine, so we do the triangulate node, and then, ah, it only has one triangulation. It's connected to six, but not eight pieces. However, you might also notice if I change the method of this, not beauty, but fixed, it will go the other way. If I make one fixed one, and then one beauty one, you can see we kind of have both of the things we need here. Join these together, which is almost what we want, but now we have, like, extra geometry, right? If we look at the spreadsheet, over here, we have 1800 instead of what? It's 30 by 30. 30 times 30 is equal to 900. 2 plus 2 is 4. Minus 1, that's 3. Quick mess. This number is half of the original, and that's because we overlaid two triangulates. So make sure to merge by distance so that we don't kind of double up on these vertices. Next thing we need to do is we just need to take some of these points at random, like this one, this one, this one, and assign some of them to be mines. I'm literally just going to make an attribute. It's a Boolean called mine. And then to check, is it a mine or not? One, like, obvious thing to do is, yeah, you could do a random value boolean. If I look at this, it kind of randomly assigns stuff. But because we want to have this matrix rain effect eventually, we need kind of randomness noise, but it needs to be continuous so that we can move it downwards. So I'm just going to take a noise texture, which goes between 0 and 1. I'm going to check where is this greater than some threshold, which you can think of saying how many mines do we have. So if it's greater than 0.5, it's going to be about half of them. So let's see that going in here. Finally, to check if this is working, I'm going to separate this geometry by what is and is not a mine. This is going to be our criteria, and you can see we're getting about half of the cells where we can make it more or less, but the thing I really like about this is I can change this dynamically, specifically for the coordinate system that tells us where the noise is going to be mapped. I can add, or in other words, offset on the x-axis or the y-axis. They should be able to maintain some kind of consistency. I'm going to take these nodes that define our diagonal grid thing, control G to make them a group, and I think I do want to be able to control the resolution. Now we can kind of densify or lucify these things. Okay, so now we have our minds and we need to make a bit of a detection algorithm. We literally just take a point, we look at all outgoing edges. So for example, at this end point right here, we check, is it a mine? Does it have that attribute on? And then we do that and we add it. So this would be two mines, three mines, this one skipped, four, etc. There isn't really an easy way to do this without going deep into topology nodes. You've heard of geometry nodes, but have you heard of topology nodes? Yes, we can do a accumulate field to sum things up. It isn't necessarily obvious what we're summing or how we can define it. I'm going to take our attributed grid and I'm going to say for each element, in other words, for every single point, I want to do a certain calculation. The calculation I want to do is I want to say, show me your neighbors and tell me how many of them have that mine attribute enabled. One kind of clever way to do this is we can take our geometry and I can separate, but this time I'm going to separate by edges. What edges do I want to keep and which ones do I want to throw away? Well, it's exactly any edge where one of its two 
endpoints. So this is going to have two endpoints where one of the two is the one we care about. So this edge right here, one of its vertices is the one we care about. One isn't. Whereas this edge way off to the side, neither of its vertices are the ones we care about. Just going to add more node groups. This one is going to define our mines. And we probably want to be able to control this threshold of what is or isn't a mine. I want to separate edges depending on if the edge vertices. So here's a bit of topology notes. Every edge is going to have two vertices with their own indices. I want to check, is that equal to the index we're looking at for each iteration? And that is as easy as taking this first index. And we're going to check, is it equal to the one we're currently looking at? Or either one's fine. Is the other one equal to? So index two, this, and connect these. So this output basically tells us, is the edge touching the mine or vertex or whatever that we care about? I want to separate geometry by this criteria. And we're going to do more to this, but this is what we want outputted generally. Anyways, for each of these stars, I want to accumulate how many of them were mines to begin with. So now I run this accumulate field, or I could literally just do an attribute statistic. Let's do an attribute statistic. It seems cleaner. On this star, where what am I trying to find the sum of? The sum of the mine attribute. If I now take this sum and store it on the original point, I'm going to take this, I'm going to store named attribute, specifically the sum, and I'm just going to call this parameter neighbors and have this be outgoing. We now basically have a bunch of points. The beauty, I say, the beauty of this is now if we look at the neighbors, yeah, a lot of them are going to be zero, which makes sense. Oh, no, they're all zero. Clearly, I do not know what I'm talking about. I mean, when I flick through this index, it is giving the star that makes sense. What is going on here? Can you find the error? If so, tell me now through the screen. Okay, let's let's try something different, I guess. Let's just accumulate the values and then sample the index. Okay, let's try it. So I'm going to sample index on this geometry at index zero or one or two, it doesn't really matter. And what is it that I want to kind of store or take? Well, it's going to be the accumulation, it's going to be the total of the number of mines, connect that as a total. And then this is what I want to store as the neighbors. And yeah, that worked. The only issue issue is you can see the value can go up to nine because the star keeps itself. So it's not its eight neighbors, it's its eight neighbors and itself. The quick fix for this is I need to get rid of that vertex in the middle, which is going to be uniquely defined by the fact that it has the most connections. So I'm going to delete geometry, the point that satisfies its vertex neighbors. This tells me how many vertices is it connected to. It doesn't give me any information about those vertices. But where is this vertex count greater than I, I guess one would be fine, but let's just do two to be safe. And then immediately when I do that, you can see the relevant numbers go down by one. If you know what the issue with attribute statistic was, do tell me. Usually I can go back and be like, oh, I made a mistake. This is a learning opportunity. I haven't learned a thing. Let's make that a group. We can call this our neighborhood. No, neighborhood spy. For each of these, I'm just going to spawn a square or you could think of it as our grid primitive, which is just going to basically hold a texture. So let's make a two by two grid where we now instance on all our points, our grid, which is an absolute mess because they're all overlapping. I need to find the exact gap or the size that this grid should be. I believe to do that, all we need to do is we need to find the spacing between two points. If this has 30 points across, one kind of weird thing to think about is it has 29 connections, not 30, but it has one less. What I'm trying to say is if we control this like value, this value that says kind of the resolution, I can take this and then subtract one from it. I then want to find the distance. So it's the total divided by the number of things, one, and then divide by how many there are. That looks good to me. So we like this because now now this is storing our information in this like arbitrary way where we can make the grid any resolution. I guess one more thing is our neighbors are populated. They make sense. But we didn't say which one are mines, like which one are that value nine that we talked about. So inside our for each, I'm going to bring in this mine attribute into this for each element. So when I do this, this field turns into a single input. And we can say at the very end here, you can override this neighbor's value if and only if there is a mine. And if there is, set the neighbors to nine. Set material to any material. Material. And now, unfortunately, because shader nodes doesn't have like a parameter or input for me to say what the image is, we're going to need to do a lot, a lot of switch nodes. Bring in the value zero. I'm going to duplicate this, set it to be equal to one, set this one equal to two, and I won't make you watch. Okay, so we now have our tower over here. And all we need to do, all we need to do is we need to switch between these under certain conditions. Is there a switch node? No, there's a mix node set to color. So it's going to be A or B. It's going to be zero or it's going to be one. And by the way, the way we know if it's zero, or one is we take that attribute we had before the one called 
neighbors and we can evaluate this and say, oh, is this like equal? No, we don't even have an equal node. This is insane. Is it roughly compared equal to one with like a very tiny epsilon? In that case, we go from zero to saying, yes, it is one. And then we check, oh, is it two? Is it three, etc. I believe you take this and you set it to instancer. And yeah, now we have like our information passing through. The reason this had to be instancer is we instanced all of these grids over here. We can speed this up by turning this into a node group where the parameters I care about is what two things am I mixing? And then additionally, what value am I checking? Is it equal to? And now we're just comparing two things and asking, is it equal to one? And this should have an outgoing connection. Take it, input, input equal to two. Now I wanted to make sure to wait for you to test this because I'm pretty confident it's going to work and I'm not going to embarrass myself. So we take the final thing in this network. We're going to watch this one and hopefully... Yeah. Uh, why? Why? The reason this is happening is it has images, but even if I picked, you know, I don't know, the value two, it doesn't have UV coordinates to use. We can, instead of using normal coordinates, well, not literally normal coordinates, instead of UV coordinates, I believe we can do generated. And yeah, that should work. All of these need generated coordinates as well. Okay, we're getting stuff. Let's actually ensure that it makes sense. So we have all of these mines. Here we have a five, and indeed it has one, two, three, four, five neighbors. And then six is also working. The one is working. Also the blanks indeed don't have anything near them. And do we have something bigger than six, like a rare seven or eight? I don't believe we do, but we do have control over this. So I can just add more mines. So look at that, by the way. Isn't that cool? Like a procedural uh, board right here. Okay, there we go. So now we're getting some sevens and eights. Now that we have our material working, the rest of it is just about shifting this down as a rain effect. What is the theory behind how we make rain? Well, first of all, remember this noise texture has a coordinate system. And generally, you can see it stays cohesive. But I do believe there's some flickering. So we have a a two, a one, and a four. If I shift this just a little, it's like a one, a four, and a three. Like it, it just changed. It didn't just shift down, it changed. Issue is, yes, we can move it, but it has to be by set intervals. So I don't want to move by like half a tile or a third of a tile. We need to go from one tile to another, a full shift, a integer multiple of the gap between them. So instead of just like putting in a random number, I'm going to combine X, Y, Z, this Y, which is the up and down can have a group input. And then that input is going to be this gap over here. Very, very, very importantly, this idea will hold as long as we multiply by a integer, not anything else. Now when I move it, yes, it's moving down, but you can tell it's kind of maintaining its form. And if I make this high, it will look like a rain effect, where of course, kind of the last step is yes, we move it down, but each column will have its own speed. So like one obvious way to animate this is you'd use something like the scene time node, you say this is like the integer, the number of seconds. But again, you're going to get this flickering because it can be a non integer, take whatever this is and round it round down or up or whatever, I'm just going to round up. And now the number of seconds is actually useful. I do want to speed this up and we can do that simply. I also made a note for this, the CG matter time node. Ha 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 ha. All it is, is it's the number of seconds multiplied by some speed and adding some offset with a few extra parameters. I literally just take the speed and I say, take the time, make it 10 times faster. So now it looks more like a scroll. And to have these have different speeds, I just need to isolate the columns. Let's take our position. We're going to look solely at the X component because every element in the same column has the exact same x take this throw it through a randomizer like a white noise texture set to one dimensional it will take our values and basically have them randomized per strip so white noise goes zero to one let's try connecting that into the speed now you can indeed see some lines are updating some aren't let's just add a bit of a multiplier instead of going from speed of zero to one maybe like zero to 2.5 or whatever maybe let's set it to two and there you go one thing that might be worth considering is yes they're like you know between zero and two some go faster than others but it's a uniform thing. If I put a float curve kind of like in between here, you're going to see it's a straight line. What am I even saying? There's going to be as many random numbers under 0.1 as there are above 0.9. It's not like most of them are slow, but there's a few fast ones. It's kind of spread out. So what I want to do is with this float curve, I can manipulate that. So just by going like this, just with that, you can see most of them are not moving like nearly at all. But the ones that are moving, they're updating quite quickly. And that's what this kind of like bias is. So maybe we'll like kind of make a bump over here. So a very few of them will get to be quite fast, like a, a special society. The final thing to consider is how many mines should there be, which again, is something we have a parameter for. So here's like something insane, or let's kind of go the other way too much 0.7. <laughs> I mean, this is kind of cool in its own right. As for the distribution, so this isn't how many but the distribution, this is where the scale comes in. So if I make it a really low number, you can see that kind of cluster here, which is interesting, or you can make it 100 where it's effectively random. This is a general effect, we happen to move them up and down because we were going for the rain effect. 
effect, but you could totally rotate the coordinate system. Here I made a bit of a system that does a rotation, and you can tell, yeah, the numbers are glitching, but it rotates. And it is kind of cool that at least we have the illusion that when the droplets are coming down, they kind of have a tip or a lead. So this is like the bottom most part of the droplet. That's just like an optical illusion. The whole row is shifting, but it almost looks like there's little creatures, little ants. And there you go. It's been a while since I made just a piece of art that wasn't just like, here's a new technical idea I figured out. Not to say that there weren't techniques here. I think there were. I mean, that's why I gravitate to the things I do. But um, thank you for watching. As always, Blender files and uh, new CG Matter nodes that I've been adding for the asset browser. All of that is available at cgmatter.com. And that is it. Okay, goodbye.